so with a, with a title like The End of Men, how could you resist? Right. Especially at this, this month of, of humility, this month of humility, the, the friend I need to say this morning, the, the friend who actually gave me this book, the, the End of Men, she didn't even tell me much about it. She just handed it to me, put her hand on my chest and, and patted it sympathetically and looked at me with a smile and a wink and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> not bad. Now, whether my friend was genuinely sorry or not, the, the author, the author of this book, Hannah Rosen, and definitely is. And, and for me, that's what made this, this book so Im important and such a gift and why I wanted to offer it up to us to wrestle with a little bit at the beginning here as we also wrestle with this theme of humility. You see, despite its antagonistic or seemingly antistic title, it's actually not an, an anti-men book. It's not a book that litigates all the wrongs my so-called team has done to the, to the other side. It's, it's certainly not a book intended to make men feel bad about themselves or, or even hopeless. Rather, it's simply a book, at least as I read it and I've been wrestling with it, it seems to me it's simply a book that says, hey guys, all of you, hey guys, you are hurting yourselves a lot more than you need to and I hope you wake up soon and stop. In other words, for me at least, it's, it's a love letter of sorts, or at least that's how, how it's felt to me as I've read it. And ironically, I think this, this love, this love that the author expresses comes across most clearly when she engages these statistics about, about working class men. And she defines this group a little bit differently than I think that we're we're used to. For her, it includes both white collar and blue collar men, the, the so called lower class men and middle class men alike. Basically, all, every single man in this country, except for those in the, the privileged, wealthy elite. That group of wealthy, privileged men, Rosen acknowledges, is, is still, right, clearly ensconced at the, the top of the food chain, chain, so to speak. But what we need to notice, she says, and, and start talking about much more as, as smaller communities and as a culture as a whole, what we need to start noticing and talking about more is how every, she says, every other group of men is swiftly losing their seat at the table. For instance, she points out that in, in elementary school and, and high school, boys now earn 75% of the D's and F's that are given out. 75%. At the college level, she points out that now only 40% of the, the degrees go to men with that number quickly, quickly, and more and more going on the downswing. And, and because of these lower skills and, and these lack of degrees, as well as the radical, radical decrease in manufacturing, technical, and middle manager positions due to globalization, men, she says, are dropping out of the labor force at rates never, she says, never seen before. She points out that whereas in the, in the 1960s, she says, 96, 1960s, 96 of American men between the ages of 25 and 54 worked, today it is only 80%. 96, all the way down to 80%. Male earnings, she says, have dropped 30% in the past 40 years, and now for the first time, 20-something women now earn more than 20-something men. Now, I got to say, when I shared that up at, at our sister church, First Unitarian, there, there was a group of women that was cheering that on. So we're allowed to do that a little bit here, right? It's not, not all bad. There's some stuff in here to, to celebrate. But, but that doesn't negate the, the fact, Rosen says, that, that all of this, all of these stats were resulting in men dominating the unemployment roles in a way that we've never, ever seen before. And, and as we look to the future, as we look to the future, Rosen sees this trend increasing exponentially, she says. And to support this, she points out that 12, 12 of the 15 fastest growing professions in the country are now dominated by women. Her book is, is filled with statistics like these. I think you can see why my friend sympathetically patted me on the chest, right? For guys, the, the book is not easy reading. It's definitely this, this huge, huge piece of humble pie. But here is, is where my comment about this, this being a, a love letter comes in. Because 
here's the important point. Rosen, the author, does not revel in any of this. Not a, not a single piece. These are not really statistics, she says, that anybody she celebrates. There's, there's no sense of triumph in her tone. Her point is not to you know, proudly proclaim that, that men move over, women are on their way. No, rather she uses these statistics again to sympathetically say, hey men, your resistance to humility is getting in the way of you moving and healing. And none of us, none of us want that. It's a complicated argument she's making, but, but basically it boils down to this. She's saying that you know, in today's rapidly changing economy, it's not so much, she points out, that, that women are, are gaining and men are losing. Rather it is, she says, that men, having lost what they had, are now just sitting there are now just sitting there. Yes, she readily admits millions of those men-dominated manufacturing and middle manager jobs have gone away, but that doesn't mean, she points out, that there aren't other jobs available out there, such as nursing, teaching, social work, and service sector employment. Men just aren't willing to what? Drop down and take those jobs. And I use that, that phrase, drop down intentionally this morning, as does, as does Rosen, because for her, you know, there, there definitely is, no doubt about it, hubris here. There is certainly a, a dynamic in this of, of men once holding positions of status and now feeling too proud to take a job that is supposedly beneath them. But for Rosen, and here's the important part, but for Rosen, that way of thinking about it simplifies things way too much. No, for her, What's going on here is not so much men's big status-loving egos backfiring on them as much as it is men being stuck, she says, tragically, tragically stuck in a screwed up understanding of strength, in a screwed up understanding of strength. She says this, this is the, the most important, absolutely most important difference between when, men and women today Men have come to believe, she says, that strength means being able to hold it all together or at least be able to put it all back together just the way it was, whereas for women, strength is the ability to adjust, evolve, adapt, and reinvent. She uses two wonderfully provocative terms to get at this. Today, she says, in our culture, what we have is, is plastic women and cardboard men. Plastic women and cardboard men. Plastic women, she says, who see strength as the ability to, to move and, and shift, move in the midst of shifting ground. And cardboard men who see strength as only being able to hold, hold your ground. It's a completely, completely different way of, of thinking about hubris, which is why I wanted to, to bring it into our conversation about humility this month. Because if we want, she says, to, to truly, she says, understand men's lack of humility, she says, we've, we've got to see men not so much as believing that they deserve to have what they've always had, but instead we've got to see them as believing that letting what you have fall apart is a sign of weakness and even a failed life. What's really screwing men up these days, she says, is, is not you know, the cocky belief that, that I can hold it all together, but the misguided and ultimately, she says, self-abusive belief that I need, I need to be able to hold it all together because if I don't, others will judge me for that. And it's here, friends, right? Right here where I find myself bumping up against the, the only critique that I that I actually have of, of Rosen's work, albeit a, a friendly critique, because simply put, it seems to me, right, that, that it's not just men, right? Not just men who see strength as being able to hold it all together. It's all of us, right? A few more head nods than that. All of us, every single one of us. And so, so here, friends, what? What Rosen, I think, is giving us all a chance to talk and think about today is, is not, I think, just a, a 21st century economic and male struggle, but, but also this very, very human, very human struggle. And I say that without any defense of my sex. I think we're, we're guilty as charged on all those counts. But, but I'd rather say it because it seems to me that in this, 
in this there's a message and I think also a gift for every single one of us here. For instance, with everything going on in my household, with my family this past month, I, I can't help to think about, and, about how this dynamic of a screwed up understanding of strength is, has hit my own family and household this past month. I should say I got permission from my wife Karen to, to share the story I'm about to share, but I should also say that at first she was hesitant to allow me to share it because she was afraid it would embarrass her or you all would judge her for this. And then she thought, she thought more about that. She said, well, I guess that's the point, you know, <laughs> isn't it? Which you'll understand uh, a little bit better in a moment. For those of you who are new or, or visiting today, I should explain that my wife, Karen, is, is co-minister along with me up at, our, up at our sister church and also preaches down here regularly. And about a month ago, due to some pinched nerves, she's been experiencing these debilitating but because of this, she's been experiencing these, these debilitating neurological uh, events and also migraines. And, and we now, I need to say, we now understand what's going on and we expect a, a full recovery in the, in the next month or so. But at the beginning, right, at the, at the beginning of all this, when it was more unclear about what was going on and, and it just seemed like there might be no end in sight, Karn was feeling pretty overwhelmed and, and almost on a... On a regular basis, she would, she would break down and apologize, quote, for not being stronger. You know, for not being stronger. Saying things like, you know, I, I just feel like I'm letting people down. And literally, as if taken directly from Hannah Rosen's book about men, she'd say things like, I feel guilty that I haven't been able to hold things together. I feel so guilty that I haven't been able to hold things together. And I have to say, obviously, as I think any of us would, my, my first response to that was, was huge sympathy, huge sympathy. It's, it's hard for any of us to, to watch someone we love go through that. But, but I got to admit, and I'm a little embarrassed to say this this morning, but, but right alongside that, that huge sympathy for Karn when she said that I found me having this, this odd other experience. Again, I'm, I'm not proud of it, but I found myself getting oddly angry, oddly angry at her. And this little voice went off in my, my head, almost an aggressive voice that, that, that said this in my head, how dare you, Karen, for being so cocky? How could you be so cocky? You know, how, how dare you think that you are so much better than the rest of us? Right, the rest of us who, who bumble and, and bumble and stumble and, and break. How dare you? Not my best compassionate husband moment, right? <laughs> Not really at all. But you know, friends, as I've been wrestling with this more, now I'm, I'm not so sure. And I'm thinking today that maybe it was a, a better husband moment than I thought. And just to be clear, I need to say, I'm not saying that in that moment I should have said those words out loud to Karin. God knows I should not have, in that moment, said those words out loud to, to Karin. But you know, the, the more I've thought about my reaction, the more I have come to believe that it is actually not something for me or any of us to be embarrassed about. And dear friends, I think we all, every, every single one of us, have this aggressive, this this aggressive and protective instinct inside of us when we witness ourselves or others beating themselves up for not being able to hold it all together. And I think that's, that's a good instinct, and, and not just a good instinct, but I'm coming to believe it's also an incredibly wise instinct as well. And I think it understands something incredibly, incredibly important about humility. I think it understands that humility is not simply a, a corrective to overgrown egos, but also can be a gift that we give to our struggling selves. A gift that, that we give to our struggling selves. Because simply put right, there was, there was a, a cruelty, a cruelty in, in Karin's treatment of herself. And I think that's what I was reacting to. And it's made me realize, you know, in a way that I, that I just never have before, that there is this, this profound link between humility and kindness, between humility and self-compassion. 
right? Because to, to humbly admit that you can't and do not have to hold it all together or put it all back together is not, right, simply just a, a right sizing of the self. It's also just to tenderly, tenderly give yourself a break and options, and options as well. That's what this month is, has also taught me. It's also taught me that I think humility is, is also connected to, to giving ourselves options. And here's where I need to, to bring into our conversation this morning uh, my other favorite book of the month and, and also one of my favorite authors of all time. The author's name is, is Pema Chodron and her book is perfectly titled for today's topic, When Things Fall Apart. Chodron is a, a well-known Buddhist teacher. Some of us maybe have read, a lot of us have, have read her work. But before she was famous and well-known and before she was even Buddhist, she says she experienced the most profound Buddhist teaching of her life. That's what she calls this. She describes it also as, quote, the, the day when my whole reality gave out on me. It was a beautiful spring day, actually. She, she explained she was living in New Mexico at the time, standing in front of her adobe house, looking out at the view, drinking a, a cup of tea. She said she felt completely and, and perfectly at peace. And then in a matter of, in a matter of seconds, she says her whole life turned on its head. She says she heard her husband's car pull up into the, into the driveway, heard the, the door slam, and, and he walked around the corner and then just boom, quickly and bluntly like that, told her he was having an affair and wanted a divorce. Boom. Just like that. But what happened next, Pema Children says, surprised her. She says, right in that, that terrible moment, all, she says, all of her senses opened up. It was, she says, as if, ev as if every piece of me broke open and the whole world flooded in. She says she remembers the, the sky, you know, and, and just how huge, how huge it was. She remembers the, the sound, being able to hear the sound of the river far, far off and the, the feel of the steam from the tea rising up and, and gently caressing her face. There was no time, no sense of time in her bones, no thought in her mind. She says all there was was this profound, limitless stillness and sacred spaciousness is how she describes it. This beautiful, sacred spaciousness. And then right in that spiritual moment, she says, I quickly regrouped, picked up a rock, and threw it at him. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and that moment, that moment, she says, was so wonderfully, tragically, and deliciously human. She says, the entire, she says, the entire human predicament in a nutshell. And this is how she describes that nutshell. She says, in that moment, you know, life, life was trying to offer me spaciousness and I chose control instead. I love that. Life was trying to offer me spaciousness and I chose control instead. This is what that, that rock represents, she says the hubris and wrong-headedness of control. It wasn't just an expression of anger and hurt, which surely that was part of it, but she says it was mostly, mostly it captured her effort and her desire to just erase, you know, erase what was happening, to fix what had just occurred, to, to make him, so to speak, just disappear and have things go back to just the way they were. But we don't get that, she says plainly in her book. We may want that power, she says. We may even think we deserve that power, but that is not the gift we are offered, she says. And she goes on to write this, this beautiful passage, one of the most beautiful passages in her book. She writes, she says, in fact, the only time we ever really know what's going on is when the rug is pulled out. We think, she goes on, we, we think, you know, that the, the point is to pass the test or overcome the problem, but the truth is that things do not ever get solved. They come together and fall apart. They come together again and fall apart again. That's just the way life is, she writes. The healing comes. The healing comes from letting there be room for all of this to happen. Room for, for grief, 
Room for relief, room for misery, room for joy, and room for what comes next. We don't get control or preferences, she writes. We just get spaciousness and what comes next. Now, friends, I know that's not an, an incredibly upbeat message to hear, right? It's not. It's not at all the, you know, the peppy, pump you up, the sky's the limit positivity that we find in, in most self-help books. But, but what I love, what I love so much about it is, is I think that there's a, a beauty, you know, a, a beauty and a tenderness in children's words that I hope all of us can hear, especially those of us who, who in this very moment of our lives, and we know there are many of us here who have this happening in this moment of our lives who have, in this very moment, are now working so hard, right, to, to hold it all together or put it all back together. Go ahead and try, children says. Go ahead and try. Nobody's telling you to give up. Who knows, the, the career path, the relationship, the plans to get pregnant, the, the illness, the life story you so carefully charted for yourself, they may indeed get, get fixed, worked out, eventually put right back on track. But with that gentle voice, she goes on to say, as you do, keep your eyes fixed so squarely on those preferred prizes. Please, please, please stay aware of the spaciousness. There are always options waiting on the other side of defeat. Do not let the hubris of control blind you to that great gift. I don't think I have much to add to that this morning, to be honest. <laughs> Except maybe an image. An image that, that for me has, has brought all this together. So I just want to leave you with that that image this morning. It comes actually from a, a radio story, a, a radio story that someone shared with me that happened a couple weeks ago and then, then I listened to it back online. You might have heard it as well. It was on NPR. The story featured an American graduate student who, who went to Japan to research teaching methods and found himself sitting in the, in the back row of a fourth grade Japanese math class. The lesson was about how to draw these these three-dimensional cubes on a, on a sheet of paper. And unlike all the other kids, this, this one kid just was not getting it right. No matter how hard he was trying, he wasn't getting it right like the rest of them were. And, and the reporter said, the researcher said, he, he noticed that right away the teacher, without any kind of hesitation, as if it was absolutely normal, that teacher asked that student, that student to go up and continue to work out the problem on the blackboard in front of the entire class. This completely, completely surprised the American researcher, he said, since in American classrooms, what, the, it's the best, right? It's the best student that's invited to, to go up to the blackboards. And from there, the, the researcher says he watched this long, you know, this long, drawn-out process in which the child would, would take a, a few minutes to try to draw the, draw the cube, and then he'd pause to have it evaluated. The, the teacher would turn to the rest of the class. They'd look down at their sheets of paper, look up at his, and shake their heads, no. <laughs> then he'd go back and, and try again. The teacher would ask the students, they'd shake their head, no. And he said this process went on and on and on over a dozen times, so many times that, that he had lost count, completely lost count. And here's the thing, though. The, the researcher says as he was watching this over and over, he noticed that he, he himself, was suddenly getting incredibly anxious, incredibly anxious. My, my heart was pounding, and I, and I started to just sweat like crazy from my armpits, he said. It seemed like torture, right, watching all this, a, a type of cruelty. At any moment, the researcher explained that he expected that children would just break down, humiliated, and just burst into tears. But no tears, he said. No tears happened at all, and neither did that little child show any signs of stress or humiliation. He just kept struggling, and finally he completed the task, and upon doing so, he said he sat back and watched the rest of the class as they stood up and applauded. Boom. Just applauded. And the researcher says that this, this experience exposed for him this, this giant, giant difference between Asian and American culture and, and how they view struggle. 
In America, he explains, we see struggle as a sign of weakness and a lack of aptitude. Whereas in Asian cultures, he says, they see struggle as a measure of emotional strength and the path to human aptitude. It's very important, the researcher said, that we all understand exactly why that Japanese classroom stood up and, and offered their applause. They weren't, he said, they were not cheering his mastery and that student finally getting it right. No, they were cheering everything, everything that had gone before. The astounding, he says, the astounding and all-important moment of a human being who had no idea what he was doing, none at all, largely ill-equipped, absolutely unsure of where the puzzle ahead would lead, and yet still humbly and gratefully, he jumped into the spaciousness and the struggle, knowing and trusting that that spaciousness would offer him a great gift. And friends, today, it's not. It's not just this faith in the struggle and spaciousness that I wish, wish for us. It's also this image of knowing there is a whole class and community of friends surrounding us right now who think differently about strength and humility and thus stand ready to applaud you, you, when you humbly, humbly and tenderly forgive yourself finally for not having it under control. May it be so. Amen. Join us for worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canandaigua, a welcoming congregation. We are located at 3024 Cooley Road, four miles west of South Main Street, Canandaigua, just north of the intersection with routes 5 and 20. Look for the blue signs just before the turn. Your comments about this program or questions about the church are welcome at 585 three nine six one three seven O or at our website WWW Canandaigua UU dot org Producer and Editor Daniel Brigham <laughs>